Hello everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Carla Billington and I'm the chair of the AWA Catchment Management Network Committee. I'm an independent consultant delivering services in source water protection and catchment management. I've been working in this area for over 20 years and I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce Fiona to chair and open the webinar today. Fiona is the Executive Manager, Water and Catchment Protection with in Water New South Wales. Fiona has worked in the water industry for close to 30 years across three states, in New South Wales with Water New South Wales and the Sydney Catchment Authority, in Victoria with North East Water and the ACT in various roles within ACTU AGL. Much of her career has been spent managing water quality, whether it's associated with drinking water supplies, water and wastewater treatment, or wastewater reuse. In her role as executive manager, Fiona is seeing firsthand increasing pressure on catchment, our pressures on catchments through the impacts of climatic events, ongoing development pressures, and requests for increased recreational access. I'd like to thank Fiona for making time available today for the webinar and I'll pass over to Fiona now. Thank you, Carla, for the opportunity to join this digital debate and workshop. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land and catchments on which we are meeting here today. And on behalf of the Australian Water Association and all of us, I, I pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. There are also a number of sponsors who have contributed to the session today and we'd like to recognise that contribution. So our sponsors are Water New South Wales, the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment and Water Corporation. So for today's session, for all of us here today, a safe and resilient drinking water supply is paramount. The pressures on the catchments that provide the source water for supply are complex and increasing. And the AWA Catchment Management Specialist Network Committee has become concerned that while the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines advocate that source waters should be protected to the maximum degree practicable, there appears to be a recent trend away from this and a greater reliance on water treatment solutions. So the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines state that treatment is fallible and our experience tells us this. So this trend could increase the public health risk for consumers. So given the apparent ever increasing pressures on the integrity of our catchments, the question arises, are we doing enough to ensure our drinking water supply catchments across Australia are protected and secured for future generations? The Catchment Management Specialist Network Committee considers that a set of principles for source water protection are necessary to set the direction for preventative risk management while providing resilience to the entire water supply system. Working as one, water industry gives us strength in having a consolidated position. And so in developing these principles, the committee values your input to the draft statement that was circulated for pre-reading prior to today's workshop. So the intent of the workshop today is to explore whether we are doing enough to manage these increasing pressures on the integrity of our catchments. And our program today will cover a keynote presentation from Phil Duncan to provide us with indigenous perspectives on water management followed by a presentation from Carla Billington and Greg Green, covering where we are now, what we need, and what the urgency is behind developing a source water protection statement. And after this, we'll have a Chatham House Rules debate centered on one of the key statements in the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines regarding the protection of source waters. And we should highlight that also as part of challenging our thinking here, the people involved in the debate will be expressing views and opinions that are not necessarily the views of their organisation. So please keep that in mind as you listen. I'd also like to thank the Catchment Management Specialist Network Committee for the very well prepared session that we will be having today. This was originally planned for the Oswater Conference and the committee has worked with AWA to pivot this to a digital platform and have put together a very engaging session. So while we get kicked off, some housekeeping notes to make sure everything runs smoothly. Can we ask that attendees mute themselves um, until the breakout sessions kick off and also that videos be turned off until we are back in, until we are back in the breakout sessions. Uh, note that this session is being recorded and may be made available on AWA's official YouTube channel or website. So please contact AWA if you have any questions on this. And throughout today, um, if you have any questions, we'll be monitoring the chat function. So post your questions here and we'll pick these up as we go along. 
also through the workshop today, we'll be doing some polls. Some, we'll post some poll questions um, for you. And our first poll question is coming up now. Um, so the poll question here is, you're here today because you're interested in catchment management. Why are you here and why are you interested? Let us know. So hopefully we'll get some results back soon. So overwhelmingly, you know, people are passionate about catchment management and they work in the field. So we've got a lot of people here with a lot of knowledge and a lot and a very strong interest in what we're talking about today. So that's great. Should get some very good outcomes. So what we might do is move on to our keynote presentation, which will examine Indigenous perspectives on water management. So Phil Duncan is a Gomorrah man from Moree. He holds a position at Macquarie University and is the new chair for the Murray-Darling Basin Authority Community Committee. Phil was unable to be with us today in person, but kindly agreed to pre-record his presentation. So I'll ask all of you to please ensure that you're muted so that we can now listen to our keynote presenter. Yama. Yama Gabalinda. Hello and welcome. My name is Phil Duncan and I'm a traditional owner from the Gomeroy Nation in the northwest slopes and plains of New South Wales. Um, I want to firstly say thank you to the AWA for giving me this opportunity to present and also um, trust that uh, my presentation today about cultural science and Aboriginal voices in the water industry will be informative but also create some challenges for people to start thinking outside the box. Because throughout my 25 years plus involvement in Aboriginal water movement, um, there is a new concept called nothing about us without us. And it's based on the platforms of self-determination, self-respect and self-management, uh, particularly in the water arena where we have been somewhat uh, operating in a vacuum for quite some time. Next slide, please. As it is customary with um, Aboriginal people, I want to share some stories with you about my mentor, who was my grandfather. Um, and that is a picture up in the top right hand corner of my grandfather standing under the tree that he was born under. And the bottom left hand is uh, a picture of me under that same tree 44 years later. Now, it's significant because uh, my grandfather is the baby of seven children and uh, each of those children were born under that tree and each of their placentas were buried around that tree. Now, my father's the oldest of 12, nine boys and three girls, and I'm the oldest of 127 grandchildren. So I'm the oldest of the next generation. And keeping these stories or our law, L-O-R-E, alive and the family continue, continuous connection two sites of significance and particularly place um, is paramount in our minds as we go forward. And making those stories and that information available to the wider community is something that we um, need to continue to do. Next slide, please. Not only is um, object and water and place on, on country, we also turn to the astronomy. Now, um, my nation, we are called Big Sky and we have the um, Siding Springs um, Observatory out at the Warren Bungle Ranges uh, on, within the Gomeroy Nation. And my dreaming is that of the dinner one, the emu, who resides in the Milky Way. And I wanted to share these, em these images of the dinner one with you because the dinner one is my mother. 
I am, uh, according to our cultural law, I, and I practice this religiously, I do not partake in any emu products. I don't hold, uh, eat emu, and I'm actually a protector of the emu or the dinner one. But the dinner one is my mother, and that should give you a greater understanding or appreciation that we are actually a matriarchal society and we follow our mother's lines. Next slide, please. Um, I started out by saying nothing about us um, without us. And this is just sometimes to go forward when we're looking at the opportunities for Aboriginal people to have their voices raised and greater activity and participation in water management and planning. We need to walk into the future backwards. And the image I show you is from 1887 of people along the Murray River. And um, in another life, I'm also in my second term on the National Indigenous Strategic Advisory Council for the CSIRO. And when we went to the Gama Festival, um, that banner that we created, it says Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, Islander peoples, Australia's first scientists. And that's the reason why I use this term. Uh, I, I believe that we need to transgress, transgress from traditional ecological knowledge to actually branding it a cultural science because it is. We know our cultural landscapes and we know how to interact with it. We exist in a symbiotic relationship with our cultural landscapes. It's not um, both the land looks after us and we have a, a cultural obligation to be involved in the caring for and repairing of country. So again, just reaffirming that we know our cultural landscapes. We know how to interact with it and move through them. Next slide, please. Threats to um, Aboriginal communities, um, Emeritus Professor uh, Richie Howard of Macquarie University um, has been very proactive and has a long, long um, history with Aboriginal people, particularly in the Sydney Basin. Well, not just within the Sydney Basin, but specific threats to um, Indigenous peoples and our cultural relationships and our duties and customs involving our traditional lands accompany these general processes threatening our very survival. Um, the message in there is that, you know, um, we need to be engaged more proactively to realise our potential to be better at um, our cultural obligations in looking after country and being involved in the repairing of country, wetlands, etc. Next slide, please. To give you um, a bit of a, a, a global view, as well as bringing it back down into the, this nation of Australia, First Nations peoples, we are a minority of the global population. We are 300 million or 7,000 million people. Um, for many of those First Nations peoples, we are um, dispossessed. We are marginalised. Um, and the opportunity for us to um, Um, we're dispossessed of land and water knowledge and a cultural way of life in a lot of circumstances because access, access to sites of significance, access to rivers, access to wetlands um, is the legacy uh, of, of dispossession and continues in the economic, social and political disadvantage. Um, in Australia's Productivity Commission's report, Overcoming Indigenous Disadvantage, key indicators in 2009, actually uh, show that there is um, continuing high levels of um, disadvantage faced by Indigenous communities in Australia across a wide, wide range of indicators, um, including health, access to justice and education, and obviously abnormally high levels of incarceration. Next slide, please. We continuously have to ever be ever evolving. We continue have, continuously have to adapt with change, particularly uh, um, our desire to plan for periods longer than four years is uh, pretty much been mitigated because um, those opportunities, because we have to, we can only plan for a term of government. But we definitely have the right to be engaged and we always have to revisit um, you know, certain platforms, both international and, and state and federally, um, and look at, you know, changes to legislation. The Native Title Act affords us, particularly Section 211, um, gives us access, um, the federal government, 
But in New South Wales, we have in the 1990, the 1983 Aboriginal Land Rights Act, and it's recognised by the United Nations Permanent Indigenous Forum as the most progressive act of any state for Indigenous people in the world. Um, and then we have the 2007 Water Act that um, disadvantages us to a great degree too, because it only has to have regard or give regard to um, our cultural values being interwoven into water sharing plans um, and water resource plans under the National Water Initiative. Um, and I believe that the time is here and now for us to look at amending um, these uh, mechanisms that impact on our uh, right to access water. Because when you have a native title claim, it gives you exclusive rights. And when you look at section 211, it actually says lands and waters, of um, access to lands and waters under the Native Title Act. And one of the difficult issues for proponents such as government, when they come to engage with us, is to understand that, you, you know, particularly Article 28 of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, you must come to us and seek our free prior and informed consent. Um, it's not easy engaging with Aboriginal people, but we have to, as a people, we are ever evolving, ever looking at windows of opportunities to increase our voices, particularly in the water industry or the water arena as we go forward. And we all understand how um, important water is, not just to the whole of society, but in, in Aboriginal society, it's centrality to life as everything evolves around it. Um, that symbiotic relationship, what happens on the land can impact on the water and vice versa. Next slide, please. So what we have embarked on with this um, new uh, platform of cultural science is um, integrating our cultural values into Western science and Western methodologies in uh, water sharing plans and water resource plans and particularly with research platforms. And, you know, I again reaffirm that our science is a cultural science. It is a science and it should be appreciated and respected as such. But, you know, water is protected by our law, not LAW, land, air and water, um, but by our law, our cultural law. It is our song lines, it's our dance. Um, my song line is that of actually that of Boober Lagoon uh, up on the Queensland New South Wales border. And my spiritual being, Gutio, uh, as far as our law is concerned, still exists within that um, lagoon. And we have um, management parameters around how we interact with that site. Um, our dreaming stories, our art, the background of the art uh, of my PowerPoint is um, that of uh, freshwater meeting salt water. And uh, many people um, sitting around talking about how we, um, as a council, because we did have our governance, still do have our governance in both traditional, semi-traditional and modern forms. We must reconnect with our uh, own water knowledge um, and our own methods of interacting with the water. Wetlands were our supermarkets, still are in a lot of cases. And when you uh, talk to our elders, um, you know, how the old people did science and tell the stories our way. They created our laws. One of the problems that we have is that there is still not a safe environment for us to have these, um, a culturally safe environment where we can have what I call courageous conversations about our wants, needs and aspirations in the water arena. And for us to realise our potential, we need to have a greater, create the greater understanding and appreciation of these cultural values that we have that are uh, fundamental to our uh, relationship. What a lot of people don't understand is the intangible. They can understand the object and the play, uh, place of significance by seeing it, but they, because the spirituality, our spirituality is, invi is invisible to a lot of people, it becomes intangible. But, it, but understanding those creation stories and those song lines and understanding the song lines and the connection to country um, and creating a heightened understanding of our cultural obligations to look after country, to interact with country in a sustainable way. That validates our science. Next slide, please. Um, you know, our creation sites, our cultural hero stories linking spiritual significance along the song line, the dreaming tracks. 
uh, the language, I mean, in my language, Gali is water, uh, resource sites for, you know, traditional medicines, bush foods, healing products. Um, I would not at liberty to give that information about certain uh, vegetation across my country, but it's certainly um, something that I practice and um, partake in every day. I actually uh, make my own bush medicine and drink it every day. Um, resource sites for artifacts, tools, arts and crafts, water for access protections, the grinding stones are usually beside water holes uh, and reeds for weaving, making coolamins from the trees. The other thing that people need to understand is these gender specific sites, men's and women's business. Um, I think that speaks for itself, but in the water arena, I think that there is there needs to be a greater voice for our, our um, um, female elders and our women in, in, in communities to um, be listened to and heard uh, a lot more because water is um, probably more connected, particularly in my nation, the Gondwana nation, to the um, female aspects of our society or our nation. There are ceremonial sites. The tree that I showed you that my grandfather was born in, born under, um, was beside Terry High High River. And at the moment, that's a dry riverbed. And his brother was buried um, at the junction of the Nana Branch of Terry High High River uh, underneath his favourite tree. So we have burial sites also close to water. And there are sites that are known and sites that certainly will never, ever be known. Next slide, please. So surface water and groundwater are specific values. They're teaching sites. One of the uh, Australia's most heinous um, or most um, recognised um, events in the frontier battles is Mile Creek um, up on um, Gomeroy country with the Quiamble. Uh, he's now, by creating an understanding and, 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 and the significance of that site and that event in, in Australia's political history, and the plight of people in the Northwest Slopes and Plains of New South Wales that is now known as the Moyle Creek Reconciliation Site. And it's an interactive, interpretive centre where people can go and uh, learn, but also to sit, research and um, do their work in, a, in an environment that is safe. Um, and I think the key words is, is now a reconciliation site that brings um, past, current, and will be there for future generations to come together. You know, um, the cultural specific environmental conditions to sustain our totemic species or our cultural keystone species. Now, um, uh, the Murray Cod in some parts of the, the Murray Darling Basin is known as Gadu, more in the, uh, sorry, Pondy, more in the south. Up home, we call it Gadu. Um, and, you know, the yellow belly or the Macquarie perch. Um, and the eel tail catfish, they and the, the silver perch or dungai uh, are certainly significant totemic species um, to my people of the Gomorrah Nation. We had a, a, a cultural economy. It was based on bartering, and we usually um, traded ochre, um, wooden artifacts, and other tools up and down the river, up and down the river systems. Um, and food was obviously a, um, a part of that, that bartering system and exchange. The other, other issues that were opportunity for learning about the sites that contain physical and tangible evidence, middens, campsites, scarred and carved trees, um, stone arrangements, such as the Bayamis Nunu, the Bring and fish traps that are out there on the Darling. And it is a significant site. Um, and it is still used as a cultural educational site now for um, young people and the tourists that come and go just to see that. Our rivers are also our, our, our highways, but they're also boundaries for our, our nations as well. The other thing is that we had seasonal indicators and indicators of the health of the country and water. So we always understood that for instance, my grandfather taught me that I was never ever, that he was never ever able to go into the uh, waterways with any animal fat or, or ceremonial paint on him after corroboree or after ceremony for fear of upsetting the ecological cycle uh, within that particular part of the system. Um, I'm giving you these backgrounds and these values 
because I'm only going to give you a snapshot today and hopefully it creates a greater curiosity to learn more about um, the symbiotic relationship and the, the cultural responsibilities we have to look after garlic, look after water and um, our cultural landscapes with it. Next slide, please. So I present a challenge to the water industry because we know our vision. We want Indigenous-led water research and, and units across all government agencies and um, education facilities or institutions. Uh, we'd like the federal government to look at a National First Peoples Water Advisory Body. I think that is currently being explored and being discussed. A National First Peoples Water Think Tank, a CRC, where we can um, lead our, our research in partnership with other scientists and create a two-way knowledge uh, platform where we not only can have the opportunity to have Western science methodologies and knowledge integrated into our cultural way of life, but we can also have our cultural values and methodologies interwoven into Western science initiatives and our on-country research. And one of the difficult challenges is for us is that we, we are very, very short on water holdings, a volume of water. So, you know, we'd like, we've got the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office, we'd like the First Peoples National Water Office or a water holder or a trust of some site, um, size that where we could have access to a volume of water that can be distributed throughout different valleys and different systems um, to afford us a greater say in the designing and implementation and planning of water resource and water sharing plans. Um, next slide, please. So I talked about um, two-way two uh, two -way learning opportunities, and I call it the cultural knowledge exchange circle. And you know, we need to create a two-way capacity building, assist water planners and fish scientists, build their cultural capacity and their cultural integrity. Um, we want people to feel safe and confident that we can uh, be innovative in the way we engage based on the platform of free prior and informed consent. I come back to reiterate this need for a, um, a safe and empowering space for Indigenous opinions where we can have the courageous conversations and the debates and, um, and, and negotiate outcomes. Um, because partnerships going forward for Aboriginal people in the water arena is paramount in a lot of, a lot of key um, Aboriginal leaders' minds at the moment, facilitating meaningful relationships with community and partners. Um, I think one of the big opportunities that presents itself now, particularly in the Murray-Darling Basin, um, is um, Indigenous food security and looking at partnerships with the rural sector. But the other opportunity is too, is that we have a whole, dis, uh, a whole cohort of people that still live on their traditional homelands. And one of the big issues for those people is the lack of infrastructure um, that provides quality water for everyday life, human consumption. And if you look at the Closing the Gap report this year, 2020, um, we are still somewhat, our life expectancies are still somewhat significantly less than that of uh, the mainstream population. And those figures can be exacerbated um, the more remote and isolated you get. And again, it, it, it shouldn't be a revelation to people, but water, quality water for everyday existence in those communities is non-existent. But we are getting better at it and we need to get better at it. Um, at the end of the day, I think that um, with the two-way knowledge exchange and the opportunities that presents, we need to make sure that in, there is Indigenous voices included in the stakeholder initiatives and the decision-making around any water resource or any water sharing plan or any initiative um, that needs to be implemented or, or looked at design, being designed for a greater uh, participation of Aboriginal people in the water arena. Um, that shouldn't be rocket science. So the next slide, please, and the final slide. Um, this is where I say, you know, it's, we don't have a word for goodbye. You know, to us is we'll go. But I want to leave you with my totems that have been gifted to me by my grandfather. 
our nation's totem is the guana, the Yutendali. It's always climbing, it's always looking to the skies, always looking for opportunities. Um, don't want people to be like, when, when you look at doing stuff or interacting with the indigenous people and community, don't be like the dinner one, the emu, and go at it at fast pace. Because sometimes you could hit a little bump and then you could end up in a destination that couldn't be any further um, where you wanted to be with the type of research or the type of engagement you want to have. Look at the little footprints in the sand on the wider, on the banks of the wider river. That is a biggie bill of the porcupine or the echidna. I think that is significant for me because the message I want to give you there is leave a mark. Make sure that you take short steps. Sometimes time should not be the, the um, issue the outcome of the interaction and the relationship should be paramount in your mind and in the middle is a site of a tool site of significance in the middle of the terry high high river uh, on, on uh, terry high high where my grandfather was born and it is a tool site and that's where um, all our tools both weapons and tools for everyday life were made um, and water was central to that so uh, i hope that I've given you a snapshot, um, or I hope I've uh, given you a little bit, raised a greater curiosity to learn more, um, and given you some confidence to um, wade into the indigenous water arena um, and look at supporting the growing need for a, a, a greater voice in the water arena. So I say your name, and Marabu is thank you. Hi, Phil. Thanks a lot for that fantastic presentation. Um, I certainly learnt a lot and certainly opened my eyes to several aspects that I'm going to go away and think about in a lot more detail and, you know, have conversations uh, with yourself and, and others. I'd like to ask uh, you a couple of questions just to round out uh, this part of the uh, webinar. Uh, the first one was, um, would you agree that there's good alignment between the objectives to protect Indigenous culture and water quality when drinking water catchments are managed as natural spaces? That's certainly been something that I've been, you know, thinking about quite a lot in the past. I think we need to get better at it. I understand the needs uh, and the demands um, on the resource from particularly industry, but those demands should not supersede the need for quality water for everyday life. And, you know, I could tell you a story about uh, my visit to Will Canyon a few years ago at the height of the drought and the smell of sulfur um, in the air from the bore water and, you know, town bottled water being trucked into communities from Walgut, Brewarrina, Burke, all the way down to Menindi. That was, um, that was disturbing to watch. Mm -hmm. So whilst I understand the need for a strong environment rural industry, it shouldn't supersede the need for quality of life through access of, of water quality just for everyday existence. Yeah, totally. And I think if we can, when we look at managing our drinking water catchments as natural spaces, so without as much development, I think that then we can, you know, draw some alignment with a lot of the things that you've been talking about. So, um, you know, to tread softly, to, to think about the, you know, the, the history of locations and not, and to have a really resilient sort of landscape that sort of has that longevity, not just, you know, more of a short term um, sort of outcome. So, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Um, the other question that I had was beyond the protection of the heritage sites, which you talked about, how um, do you think catchment managers can best work with Indigenous people to protect the broader cultural and spiritual value? So those intangible things that you were talking about, mm. I think some, um, some of us probably struggle a bit when it comes to, like I understand conceptually when you talk about those intangible values, but I wonder specifically how we bring those into our water planning processes or what ideas mm -hmm. you've got. Because I think equally that's something that uh, the general public could really engage with and see um, the value of, but we have to draw them to it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, no, it's a very good question. I think there is a greater appreciation and uptake on the desire to interweave those cultural values, um, both tangible and intangible into, war, into the development of water sharing and resource plans. And I think that the people that have been successful at that have sat 
with Aboriginal people, and forgive me for um, using this analogy, but I've sat on the riverbank under the tree and listened to the stories um, because I, there is, um, to be able to get a greater appreciation, you need to step outside your comfort zones and, and engage probably in an environment that's more culturally suitable to the people telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, it is really hard to understand the intangible, but when you sit with elders on country, um, I think that, that, that there is a greater feel for the journey, feel for the story. Um, and, you know, we are not the only culture in the world that has this um, symbiotic relationship with our water. Um, I think that there is a, if we can get it right in the Indigenous space and here in Australia, we are looked upon globally as, as the best water planners, so to speak, in the world. Um, but in a lot of people's eyes, we still haven't got it right in the Aboriginal, the First Nations uh, arena, but we are certainly getting there. Um, I think that um, as we go forward over the next four to five years, I think if we are not able to look at amending instruments um, of federal and state governments to uh, embrace the, these cultural values and this cultural way of life and this cultural way, cultural methodology, uh, methodologies of interacting and manage, managing the water resource, I think we ought to fail the people and the people of the next generations. Because the thing is, at the end of the day, there is this synergy between environmental water and cultural water. Mm -hmm. And that alone should be something that connects us as human beings, not just Indigenous, but from a whole of community perspective. Because we will be judged by the next generation of our kids and our grandkids on the state of the environment we leave them. But if we can leave them a solid platform of where they are comfortable in understanding our teachings now that can help guide them going forward, that's where the real value is for me. We may still think that we don't do get it right, but we got to keep at it. We got to keep our shoulder to the wheel because I want your kids, Carla. I want my grandkids. I want your kids. I want them running together. I want them fishing together. I want them um, protecting um, our environment for the future generations that will come after them. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate you being with us today. And um, we will leave our, this part of the presentation and move on to the debate. Thank you very much. I hope that everybody enjoys um, my snapshot into Indigenous water and I certainly value and appreciate my relationship with AWA and hopefully you can um, get stronger and better, not just with me, but opportunities for other Aboriginal voices to be heard in the future. So, you know, thank you very much, Carla. Absolutely. Thank you, Phil. Well, that was a great presentation from Phil. Um, so we'll move on now. Uh, Greg Green and I will now present on the main theme of uh, the webinar, and that is uh, protecting our drinking water supplies. Are we doing enough? The Australian Drinking Water Guidelines state that the most effective and efficient means of assuring drinking water quality and the protection of public health is through the adoption of a preventative management approach that encompasses all steps in the water supply chain from catchment to consumer. The effective management of our water supplies therefore requires governments, water authorities, indigenous people and land managers to work together to put in place a range of measures across the multiple barriers. I think that most people in the water industry would agree with these principles. 
The Australian Drinking Water Guidelines also advocates that source water should be protected to the maximum degree practicable and that full reliance shouldn't be placed on water treatment alone. But what does this mean in the current context? In many regions of Australia, there appears to be a trend away from this preventative management stance with a greater reliance on water treatment solutions to manage current water quality risks and to implement enhanced water and treatment to enable further catchment development. Development in catchments with higher intensity land uses is occurring with development in inner catchments particular concern. These are photos, examples of photos of land uses that I have observed in inner catchments during the last few years when I've been doing source water vulnerability assessments. Recreation and catchments, particularly the inner catchments again, is also seeing an increasing trend. And in some, reg in some regions of Australia, with water system systems having to manage increased risk associated with high impact activities. The effect of extreme events must also be, be considered. These events can cause water quality parameters to move outside the normal treatment range. And it's certainly likely that there will be more of these events in the future and that their consequence could be severe and prolonged. If we considered the relationship between source water vulnerability and water treatment, ideally water treatment capacity would be equal to or greater than the source water vulnerability. In the case where the water treatment capacity is a category three, as per the health-based targets method, and the water resource vulnerability is a category one, the difference could be considered a safety margin or the de designed redundancy within the source water barrier. This safety margin can account for uncertainties in the risk assessment process, the influence of water quality variability outside the normal range, or potential failures in water treatment. Alternatively, over the last few years, I have heard of some people in the water industry refer to this dis difference as headroom or potential development capacity within the system. To consider the safety margin as headroom is a fundamental shift away from the principles of the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines and one that needs considerable discussion. Furthermore, in some instances, there can be a water treatment log removal shortfall. In this case, a one log shortfall may require improved assessments to reduce uncertainties or improved operations and may generally be considered within the safe ban while greater than two log shortfall may, be, may move into the marginal or unsafe ban, ban and require improved source water protection or enhanced water treatment. Where a new development is likely to cause water, a water treatment sh shortfall, when should, we, that, when should that development occur or when should a preventative management approach be taken to reduce the source water risks to as low as reasonably practicable. If a new control measure is required, if a new control measure is required, how many water treatment utilities are confident to invest in source water, water protection measures rather than or alongside enhanced water treatment? or on balance, is UV often the accepted management response in most cases? I'll now pass over to Greg, who will go through the draft source water protection statement. Great, thanks Carla. Um, so if we can move on to that next slide. Fantastic. So while the um, AGWG contains, I guess, overarching governance um, guidance around the importance of source water protection um, and the critical role that um, catchments play, um, the Catchment Management Specialist Committee really considered that there needed to be more of an industry specific position around the key elements of what source water protection really looks like so that water authorities and government can really focus on those. As Fiona mentioned in her introduction, this led the committee to develop an, a national statement around source water protection, which outlined ten guiding principles centered around preventative risk management as well as building the resilience of our water supply system. 
Um, we also need to really look at um, some of the other concepts that um, Phil has raised around um, how we interweave cultural values into um, that statement as well. The committee will be further exploring the statement, um, but I guess in terms of how we, how we feel that needs to be applied, we would at the very least be aiming for utilities and others that have a role in catchment management um, to really have regard for those principles and in the development and implementation of their catchment programs and um, activities. So what are the 10 principles that we're talking about? Next slide, thanks. The first principle is really um, an overarching statement that's in line with the ADWG and directly relates around the intent um, for protection to the maximum degree practical and also taking a preventative management to um, source water management. Similarly, the second principle really aligns to the ADWG statement that the multi-barrier approach is universally recognised as the foundation for ensuring safe drinking water and that no single barrier is effective against all conceivable sources of contamination, nor is it 100% um, effective all the time. Um, treatment plants can fail for a number of reasons, so um, we can't just rely on, on, on a single um, a barrier as such. Again, the third principle is fundamental. Any risk to um, human health must be regarded as serious and um, given priority over other objectives and decision-making. Now, this aspect of primacy uh, may be controversial with some water authorities preferring a, a principle around a more balanced approach um, to all management values, including um, protecting indigenous values, providing public access, recreation, flood mitigation, as well as security of supply. But wherever possible, um, complementary outcomes should be sought and certainly it's gonna be a topic that we'll be um, discussing further in um, today's webinar. Next slide, thanks. The next principle is, is built around, um, I guess the need to avoid complacency. And by this, we mean that good historical performance should not be a reason for permitting increased development in the catchment. And that we also need to maintain those areas that are, are already well protected and are good, uh, rather than just focusing our, all of our attention on uh, addressing degraded areas. Related to all the principles so far, the precautionary principle should be applied um, to decision making concerning our water supply catchments um, and development being undertaken um, within those. The precautionary principle tips the balance of favour um, to protecting um, water quality in the absence of certainty. The next principle um, really relates to catchment lands and source waters should be considered as assets. The value of, um, of such should be clearly articulated and investment and decision-making should maximize benefits and minimize costs to the whole water supply system and be made on a risk basis. Investing in our source water um, catchments can make economic sense when compared with additional water treatment and also contributes to a whole range of other catchment objectives. However, we do need to acknowledge that due to the effect of, of a variable um, climate and variable water quality, which may be related to extreme events, it's not always practical to reduce source water risk within the acceptable treatment capability limits. This continuity in extreme events is our next principle. Next slide, thanks. Communication is the basis of, the, of, of our next principle. It's really incumbent on the water providers to not only protect drinking water catchment sources, but also communicate the importance of source water protection to the community. And this in turn will um, help positively influence behavior of our catchment community. The second last principle is a bit of a mouthful, uh, but essentially what it means is our source water protection requires inputs from a various range of disciplines and knowledge from social, cultural, political, economic constructs. Source water protection involves society. And, and you can't sort of ignore that. And with, with the associated challenges, often having complex um, dynamics, uncertainties, high political stakes in decision-making, and these complexities should not be overlooked. And finally, and this one particularly resonates with me and my experiences in source water protection across a couple of states over many years, and that is water providers need to set the standard for our catchment protection, and we should be implementing best management practices as well as partnering with others, with government agencies, community groups, industry groups, and indigenous stakeholders and catchment landholders to achieve source water protection. So um, with this in mind, I wanted to, um, I guess, just, just pause here. We've got another polling question um, we want to um, bring up regarding um, the principles and whether you um, agree with any of these. And we'll share the results of those in our breakout sessions later. So Tomo, can you um, launch that?
Okay. So with these going principles in mind um, and the context set about the importance of source water protection as made by um, Carla Fiona and also Phil, it's time to step back and, um, and I, I guess test these principles. The ADWG states that prevention of contamination provides greater surety than removal of contaminants by treatment. So the most effective barrier is protecting our source waters to the maximum degree practicable. However, is this principle still relevant in 2020 and are we doing enough to support it? To address this um, key question, we've recruited six industry specialists to have a formal debate around this very question, three for the affirmative and three for the negative. And I'll introduce the um, debate panel in a moment's time. Next slide, thanks. So the overall objective of our debate is to really provide a wide selection of perspectives and arguments to support in, a, in an open and balanced debate. We'll follow the Chatham House rules in that speakers are representing the argument, not necessarily personal view or um, the organization's view, but are there really to facilitate and present a number of arguments in the affirmative or negative in order to generate some more broader conversation around this question when we break into our discussion groups um, and to also inform the further development of our statement. We'll be using um, online polling, another online polling question after the debate to capture your immediate thoughts about the debate. Um, and also there's a chat function um, that you can continue to use um, as we go along. And ultimately, um, the debate is going to help us further inform the development of our um, national statement on source water protection. Next slide, thanks. So I'd like to introduce our debate team. So the catchment team or the affirmative, we have Susie Sarkis from the Department of Health. Um, we have David Sheehan from Coleman Water in Victoria and also Andrew Bath from Water Corp over in WA. And for the negative, we have um, well, the, um, the, the treatment team, as we call it. We have Aaron Canning from Water Futures here in Queensland. We have Jason West uh, from um, SA Water in South Australia and also Clay Prashaw from um, Water New South Wales in um, New South Wales. So each speaker is going to speak for a maximum of five minutes and, and we'll give you a reminder at four minutes um, that your time is coming, coming to an end. I'll then call in the next member of the opposing team um, and so forth. We'll um, um, go along until the last um, speaker for the negative is finished, after which I'll hand you back over to Fiona to uh, wrap up the debate. Um, and again, a uh, reminder that we have the, um, the, the chat section in there um, as, as we go, if you want to um, raise any issues for further discussion in our breakout groups. So before I get started, can I remind all the um, debate speakers to now turn on your videos so that we can now see you? I think everybody's up there now. So I'd like to in invite Susie Sarkis um, to speak um, for the affirmative as our first speaker. So over to you, Susie. Thank you. I'll just, oh, there we go. I'll mute myself, which I have. And um, look, thank you um, to everyone um, for joining us. And I guess I just want to firstly start with um, and acknowledge the traditional owners of these lands and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. And, um, you know, Phil really, um, really brought home the importance of source waters in the context of um, Aboriginal culture. And, you know, to, to extend that, the ab traditional Aboriginal owners of these lands acknowledge the need to look after the land and waters for current and future generations and endeavour to live with the land and water rather than off the land and water, as we've heard. Um, for example, water holes are considered sacred places, acknowledging the need to protect water quality to support all forms of life now and into the future. So this legacy issue um, or the need to protect our resources today for tomorrow really, really ran true um, in that presentation from Phil. This way of living is consistent with those guiding principles in Australian drinking water. Um, in particular, the protection of water sources and treatment are of paramount importance and must never be compromised. And that the prevention of contamination provides greater surety than removal of contaminants by treatment. So today you will hear from both sides of the panel um, debate on this principle, prevention of contamination provides greater surety than removal of contaminants by treatment. So the most effective barrier is protection of source waters to the maximum degree practical. Is this still relevant today? And are we doing enough to support it? So the intent is not to diminish the value of treatment, 
clearly it is a critical component of the multiple bit barrier approach and managing risk, but rather the intent is to challenge the relevance of source wood protection in preventing harms and whether we are doing enough. The catchment management contingent will argue that the primacy of prevention, the prevention of harm, is preferable to remediable, remedial measures. You'll hear more from me on this. You will hear from David Sheen that whilst treatment barriers are generally reliable, they do fail and that this creates a strong incentive to ensure source waters are as good as they can be. The production of safe water starts in the catchment and the avoidance of additional risk is a sounder strategy than relying solely on water treatment. More broadly, if the treatment is to be used as the sole measure to deal with any additional risk, who bears the cost for the management of this additional risk and are these costs borne equitably across the community? You'll then hear from Andrew Bath that cumulative impacts within an unprotected catch-up make it impossible to treat for all harms, especially in numerous remote Aboriginal community water supplies in Western Australia. Back to the primacy of prevention. The prevention of harm is preferable to remedial actions. We are all familiar with the saying, prevention is better than cure. This mantra is adopted in public health with the principle of primacy of prevention embedded in Victoria's Public Health and Wellbeing Act, which you are seeing played out now with COVID. The Safe Drinking Water Act, catchment to tap, occupational health and safety laws, where the hierarchy of controls dictate that you eliminate or reduce the risk prior to treating it. The new environmental duty in the Environment Protection Act, 1970. These laws aim to deter based on the current state of knowledge and what is reasonably foreseeable, the intentional introduction of harms or hazards. The primacy of prevention recognises that if you don't introduce the risk or you eliminate the hazard, then the potential for harm does not exist. It's quite simple, really. While many utilities have become skilled at quantifying the scale of risk, and some are being proactive and innovative in collaborative partnerships to address both current and future planning and catchments, a greater unified effort is needed by all to reduce current risks and advocate for reducing future risks. Without bold source water protection, incremental development and land degradation will reduce water quality and put further emphasis on treatment. Notwithstanding the human element, treatment barriers are fallible, especially under challenge with severe consequences to consumers, especially when the catchment or is compromised. History does tell us this, tells us that waterborne outbreaks relate to inadequate treatment or treatment failure, complacency, and compromised source waters. And when these happen, the consequences are profound on human health. Our state of knowledge tells us that we can't treat for every hazard. In recent times, treatment plants have been challenged with unprecedented algal blooms compromising their palatability and potentially the safety of drinking water. In the face of uncertainty, especially in relation to emerging contaminants and pathogens, which we are seeing more of, the precautionary principle must prevail. The community expects that no one wants drinking water that is potentially at risk or is palatable, oh, unpalatable, I should say. For example, the new environmental duty, and let's face it, it is new, it's next year, so this is current, is at the centre of the Environment Protection Act 2017 and requires all Victorians to reduce the risk of harm from their activities to human health and the environment and from pollution or waste. The expectation is that activities are managed to avoid the risk of environmental damage. This recognises that the environment and human health are intrinsically linked. The degradation of our water resources, especially where this is intentional, should not be tolerated, especially in the context of climate change, increased competition for resources and population growth. The protection of catchments is paramount for future proofing these precious resources. This is where innovation is needed. In participating in both sides of the debate, I ask you to reflect on our reality at this point in time, that being this global pandemic caused by an emerging pathogen and consider the potential consequences of disease transmission in our communities, their impact to individuals and families and our health sector and our way of life. Never has the, the need of, for primacy of prevention been so stark. And while we have to put public health as the priority, we know the burden of waterborne disease outbreaks associated with drinking water and their root causes. We know human disturbance of ecosystems and biodiversity loss are increasingly linked to the occurrence 
and risk of diseases with the emergence of pathogens and other harms. In many instances, climate change acts as a threat multiplier. I ask you to consider what legacy we want to leave behind for future generations and what would a do no harm and no regrets approach look like? Thank you. I will now hand over you, you back. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Susie. It's a, um, a wonderful start and uh, very thought provoking and, and certainly the way you put it into today's context uh, in particular uh, was, was quite inspiring. So on that note, I want to hand you over to the first speaker for the treatment team or the negative. Um, and that's Aaron Canning uh, from Water Futures in Queensland. Great. Uh, thanks, Greg. And thanks, Susie, um, for your first first speech on your side. I'd like to acknowledge the, and pay respect to the traditional owners as well for past, present and future. Um, so, can catchment prevention provide a greater surety for removal of contaminants and treatment? Our argument is, I don't think so. Um, as Susie spoke about prevention, prevention is okay if you can measure it, control it and validate it. And our argument is we find that complicated and challenging. Um, and our sort of team line today is lack of evidence for source protection in a world of validation. So I'll talk about treatment and some of the economic and funding challenges. Jason West is gonna talk about risk and customers. And Clay is going to sum up and summarize our team case. Source protection, as I said, is a good thing. Don't get me wrong, but it's not the panacea that we all would like it to be. Um, we know we have the technology and ability to treat any source water. You know, we, this is evidenced by development of recycled water, stormwater guidelines, health-based targets guidelines. Establishment of proven indirect and direct potable reuse schemes, such as the Western Corridor um, system in Southeast Queensland or the new water scheme in Singapore. We can take sewerage and treat it to a standard that in many cases is actually better than the current potable water standards, taking the, the Queensland Public Health Act uh, regulations as, as evidence of that. With the introduction of recycled water guidelines, health-based targets and regulation, the water industry, we all live in a world now of validating, having to validate everything. That is, we must obtain strong scientific evidence that catchment or treatment barriers are capable of reducing risk and typically, uh, when we do these assessments, we have to be conservative. Um, in order, we, we know with validation, we need to demonstrate that we have removed um, whatever the hazards are under a range of different conditions, and that we should be monitoring those in real time. And we know with catchment interventions, that, that can be a challenge and very difficult. Because um, catchments are, very dynamic, subject to changes, um, either short-term changes with floods, storms, fires, increased recreation or longer-term changes such as increased development. And every catchment is unique. Um, it's not a black box like a UV system. Um, it, you know, there's so many variables within a single catchment. It's very complex to understand. So can, you re re really, can we really be sure um, what's happening in those catchments? We've talked a lot in the water industry over the past 20 years of having catchments as critical control points. I don't think anyone has really done that properly because of the challenges that exist. Treatment provides us with a much more controlled environment to manage risk than a catchment environment. Um, you know, the other side might talk about um, source ceasing some source protection activities, activities such as allowing recreation in reducing the buffer or the headroom that we talked about earlier. Um, I, can, I say the buffer can still exist, but the buffer can be built into the treatment side. So if there's a fire blog source, source, source water challenge, there's no reason we can't design a treatment plant to achieve seven log, thus providing us a two log barrier. And in many cases, um, the addition of an extra treatment barrier provides you more, more, extra, more log treatment than you actually might need because a lot of these systems come as you know, four log type of systems like a UV, and you might only need a couple of log to, to meet your um, target. Now, I just want to touch on some economic challenges. Um, there's, from my experience, challenging and justifying catchment interventions is 
very complicated. And I'll give some examples. Um, from my experience, from working in a water utility, the proportion of investment usually attributed to source protection is about 5% of what's attributed to the built infrastructure or treatment. So there's a challenge there to start with. It's difficult to establish the impact of land use alone on water quality. By the time a water quality degradation has been apparent and treatment methods have been upgraded, it's often too hard for utilities to choose source water protection as a means of addressing that problem. So the challenge there is addressing a short-term risk with, a, with potentially a long-term solution. And there's no standards for source water protection. So we upgrade it to what? Will it even work? How do we prove it will work? And how long will it take to work? A lot of those challenges and answers uh, uh, remain unanswered. And many treatment upgrades are motivated by you know, a desire to expand treatment capacity or comply with new, regular, new regulatory standards. So it sort of happens anyway. It can be difficult to determine what proportion of these costs are attributed to declines in upstream water quality. So from our case, the conclusion is treatment provides us with certainty and surety in an era of validation. And unfortunately, catchment intervention and source protection cannot do that. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Um, some really thought provoking and challenging points there and, and a few home truths as well that um, will, will be really good to, um, to, to delve into some more. So I'll look forward to um, your, your other members um, yeah, continuing that argument. So thank you very much. And now to the second speaker for the, um, the catchment team, uh, David Sheehan. Thank you very much, Greg. Um... Some very compelling arguments put forward by our opposition, or our first opposition member there and Aaron. Um, and uh, I think the first thing I'd like to state is that, uh, as most of us know, there's only about five totally closed catchments around the world. So uh, we do work in a, an environment um, where uh, most uh, water utilities have to deal with uh, catchments that have some level of compromise. But I've yet to meet a water treatment manager anywhere in the country that would be happy to see um, a poorer water quality to treat. I think all of them would like to see improved water quality and I guess that's what we're trying to offer with uh, catchment management um, arrangements. Because really what we're looking at is the death by a thousand cuts because each sort of incremental change in risk profile on the catchment, so each new septic tank you put in or each uh, new recreation area or, or each new piggery or whatever you put into the catchment, there is that uh, change in the risk profile and then that puts a whole lot of additional pressure and, and um, on the water treatment plant to actually deliver the benefits that you're looking for. And yeah, you can sort of say, well, look, I'll go off and build more barriers or put in extra, extra treatment steps. But really, wouldn't it be better to manage that in a, in a sort of a collaborative man manner between uh, what you can achieve through good catch-up management and, um, and improved source protection rather than relying on a single barrier alone? Because what you really end up doing then is managing to the peaks. And there is the, uh, the um, I guess, the risk that you may end up gold plating what you have to install as water treatment barriers. Because really what you're doing is then saying that, well, it doesn't really matter what comes down the river, we'll just take whatever it comes and we're gonna have a treatment process that deals with that. I, I would have thought a far better strategy would be to sort of say, well, what's, where's the balance sit and how can we manage both the retreatment requirements and the quality of the source water to allow us to have a better handle and um, oh, sorry, a, a, a better risk profile because really what you end up doing is um, putting so much emphasis on the uh, infallibility of the treatment processes to manage all risks where I would have thought there would be a better approach to look for that balance between what you can achieve in catchment management and what you can achieve in treatment. And the last point I'd like to make uh, is that there tends to be a fairly large cost shift in, uh, um, between uh, those who are allowed to sort of, I guess, undertake activities that compromise drinking water quality or rural water quality in the catchment area between that and those who have to pay for it. Because uh, usually what happens is the cost of living in a catchment area or a cost of recreating in a recreational reservoir is not borne by those who do the recreation, but it's actually borne by the customers of the water treatment of the water utility that has to treat the water. And I often think that's a little bit unfair. So I would have thought a better approach would be to protect what we have, 
um, keep the treatment costs under control and work on that balanced approach where both the catchment management activities and the treatment processes work towards delivering safe drinking water for our customers. Uh, so I'll leave it there, hand it back to you, Greg, and look forward to the rest of the debate. Thanks, David. Um, yes, yeah, so, some really um, strong arguments there, really um, building a case there. So uh, without further ado, uh, time to counterpunch. So over to the second speaker for the uh, negative. Um, I'll let like to introduce uh, Jason West. Well, thanks, Greg, and uh, thanks to my learned colleagues for their, uh, their personal opinions. Um, I think, um, David, you mentioned uh, how there needs to be a balance between catchment and treatment, and I agree wholeheartedly. Um, but I do question your um, affirmation that treatment is a single barrier. Um, it's much more than that, and uh, engineering and science has developed to such a level now that um, I believe uh, that we can have one failure in one barrier and still uh, be better and uh, and deliver safer water uh, compared to what might happen in the catchment. So, um, look, I'll um, I'm going to be uh, supporting the treatment argument here, and um, I want to tell you why. Uh, apart from the fact I am a treatment specialist. Um, we hear, I guess, that the catchment protection is all about risk management and the ADWG supports this approach, as do I. So uh, we're all aligned there. Um, but let's remember that risk is a combination of likelihood and consequence. The consequence of a consumer getting sick with gastro illness uh, could be regarded as quite significant, but what's the likelihood? And, and how does it compare with other causes of gastro? illness. Uh, interestingly, the government agency Ausfoodnet, Ausfoodnet um, they undertook an analysis of gastro illness in the community, a study that spanned seven years. Of the 6,515 cases that were studied, only 54, so less than 1% were shown to be uh, from waterborne illness. And of these, only 10 were found to be directly related to drinking water. So less than 0.2%. Uh, yes, we've heard Steve Hoody's uh, horror stories and we've learned to get better at managing water quality, but what's the real risk here? So let's look at a real life example. At SA Water, um, we're also of the belief that our catchment shouldn't be touched. Um, however, following requests from the government to open up the Maponga catchment to the public, we felt very nervous. Um, but we turned to science. We undertook detailed modelling of the reservoir and, and we predicted what impact the proposed recreation might mean in terms of pathogen challenge. We then put sensible controls in place, uh, signage, walkways, and we installed exclusion areas. This provided some assurance, recognising, of course, that some people won't always do the right thing. But it was treatment that ultimately gave us the confidence that our water was safe. Uh, we installed a UV that gave us four log crypto removal on top of our existing three and a half log conventional treatment process. So this is about three more, three log more than we need for our worst case contamination scenario, leaving us significantly lower risk position. We've also now included surveillance cameras and opened walking trails in a way that provides a fulfilling experience for the community. The same time made sure that re the recreators were aware and respectful of the fact that they are within a drinking water catchment. So what about our customers? In many cases it's our customers that fund management activities on the very land that we exclude from them. So what's been the impact of opening up our reservoirs at Maiponga? Well the effect was immediate. Businesses witnessed an uptick in activity and this has been sustained I've, after 12 months now. Visitor numbers continue to increase. There's a walking group now that meets every day, up to 40 people, uh, to walk around that bushland in that walking group. We haven't seen any evidence of any added disease burden in the community yet. Um, did you know uh, that the WHO released a report in 2009 on global health risks uh, where it analysed the impact of various illnesses on mortality? The main contributors were found to be lifestyle related blood pressure, 13% of all deaths, tobacco, 9%, high blood 
glucose, 6%. Physical inactivity, 6%. And obesity, 5%. The study went further, estimated the dallies attributable to unsafe water in the developed economies in the Western Pacific. Less than 0.4%. So what is the real need? Let's use the advancements in human ingenuity to our advantage and enjoy life. Exercising and socialising around our local waterways. Symbiotic relationship, as Phil Duncan mentioned earlier. Focusing on catchment management is admirable, but not an intelligent way to manage risk. We don't know what log removal we can claim or what challenges they present. So how can we rely on it? Let's face it, our catchments are already compromised. So let's enhance our customer experience and improve health outcomes into the future by investing in treatment. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Jason. Um, again, some, some really um, compelling points and I, I like how you brought in um, that recent example of opening up um, storages of recreation. So, um, I will now hand us over to the final speaker um, to wrap things up for the catchment team. Um, so please welcome Andrew Bath. Hello, welcome. Thanks, Craig. Compelling arguments given by the treatment team. Um, what one hears this from an engineering practice, the whole, the whole sort of capabilities of treatment systems, we can treat anything, we can do anything, but of course it comes at a cost. And one of the key things that we're finding is that what is that cost? What is really acceptable? It cannot, for, because of the fallibility, it cannot actually give you 100% treatment. So what do you do for that very short incident? When we've heard reportedly that there's no health consequence, this is actually not, this is actually untrue. If we look at the Sydney water incident, it was the incident that didn't make anyone sick, but it still cost tens and hundreds of millions of dollars and its impacts are still being felt. One cannot say that source protection or lack of source protection and reliance on treatment can be the sole, the sort of panacea. The whole thing is, is the important component here is that treatment, you do have to validate those processes. You can add on UV, you can add on other steps. But the biggest challenge we're seeing is that in remote areas, particularly in Western Australia with remote communities, you, you have source waters. Some of them are extremely high quality. But the problem is in terms of the location of some of those groundwater bores, they're too close to communities. They become easily contaminated. But the treatment is in a remote area where it may take nearly a day to fly out to a particular community. You can imagine the challenges. It is an important case where you've got already a degraded catchment system, but treatment cannot treat all of it. We're actually working with a catchment at the moment, which has particularly high levels of emerging contaminants. We're basically, you're in a situation where you have to ask, we're gonna to have to go back to a less degraded or ideally a pristine or protected catchment. In other words, to be able to supply customers. Treatment cannot be cover every single variable but also the complexity is what Carla was mentioning on that headspace area is what do you design your treatment plant for we talked about validation processes we look at our value data validation data for all our 96 water treatment plants their upsets continuously taking place how do you measure that do we make people sick we know that the universal that the diagnosis of illness in the community is really not it, it's it only measures an incredibly small percentage of the people who have got sick and even if you look at Havelock North in, in use in New Zealand they only learned that they were serious illness in the community once they actually had people not going to school and reporting to school so the protection of source protection is absolutely critical I think we learned from Phil in terms of Phil and also the previous speaker on Susie, it is an intergenerational. It is done for the community, for the betterment of community. And it takes, our children cannot rely on a highly complex treatment systems because we know they're fallible and they will fail. So source protection really will give you the best economic and social and even reputational outcomes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Andrew. Um, 
appreciate you anchoring the um, the catchment team and really um, pulling together um, a, a good summary of the of the case. So, um, anchoring for the negative team, Clay Prashaw. I'd like to introduce um, Clay to um, close it out for the uh, treatment team. Thanks, Greg. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, past, present, and future. And um, let me start by saying that my entire job is actually about source water protection. My, ma my title is Manager of Cash and Protection. Um, yet here I am on the dark side, arguing against cash and protection. And um, can I say I'm also doing it in front of my boss, Fiona. So let's respect the Chatham House rules and not quote me too much after the, the debate. But seriously, as an insider within cash and protection, um, there are some, some really good arguments that my team has raised that genuinely reflect the type of questions and issues that I raise in my work on a regular basis. So obviously as a manager of catch and protection, I'm not by any means gonna say that source water protection doesn't have any value. I'm not gonna suggest, and I don't think our, our team has suggested that source water protection should be ceased altogether. But the real issue I think we need to lay out here is, are we already doing enough on source water protection or we need, do we need to do more and more and more? And to answer that question, I think I'll go back to our, our team's core argument, our case line, which is that prevention of contamination does not provide greater surety than removal of contaminants, as there's a lack of evidence for source water protection in a validation in the world. So rather, the most effective system is a multi-barrier approach that is focused primarily on treatment and is supported by a range of source water protection measures. So I'll start by sort of working through rebutting the other team's arguments and then I'll try and sum up really quickly what our team has been saying. So the first speaker, uh, Susie, spoke about essentially the, the concept of prevention is better than the cure. Um, while this is surely a, a relevant argument in the case where there is a reliable method of prevention, then we accept that. But as presented by Aaron, I think it's clear that source of water protection can't really be used in the example, as an example of the cure. Um, and Susie actually used the example of COVID-19, which is an interesting and topical way to think about it, but um, because in this case, there is no cure, not as yet. And so in, at, at present, we're all relying on prevention to, to try and manage that issue. But I will note that the prevailing scientific view is that ultimately when we're gonna beat COVID-19, it is actually gonna be through a cure. And to bring it back to, to drinking water management, I think we already have um, the cure. We know that treatment works as presented by, by Aaron. We, we have various ways to, to, to treat water. And we should of course, therefore continue to, to make efforts in trying to prevent um, contamination. But while we know what works, we should continue to rely on, 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 on the treatment methodologies. So prevention is better than the cure in many contexts, but when we have the cure and it works and we don't really have an effective way of preventing, then we should rely on the cure. So the second speaker, David, talked about some of the issues with treatment plants and some of the issues that can go wrong. Um, and I guess there are two, two issues I'd like to raise about that. Firstly, the argument that treatment can fail is in fact even more the case, I would think, when it comes to source water protection, where we've, we've highlighted all the different ways that source water protection um, cannot work. And really there isn't a lot of science that you can point to to say that that alone can, can be the way to, to provide uh, safe drinking water. And the second thing I'd say about you know, treatment plants failing is as Aaron rightly pointed out in some detail, there actually can be multiple barriers within the, the treatment, the, the umbrella of treatment. So we have to remember that treatment is not a single technique, but a, you know, a, a suite of carefully constructed measures. So a single failure in the treatment system does not necessarily mean you're gonna end up with unsafe drinking water. So in, rela in relation to you know, treatment plants failing, overall, we do accept that we can't you know, just rely on a single method but the system again should be focused primarily on treatment and be supported by a range of source water protection measures. So our team presented four arguments to support the case line that there is a lack of evidence for source water protection in a validation world. Um, firstly, Aaron spoke about treatment. We know what the benefits of it are. We have decades of science to support it. And ultimately we know we can treat water to any required standard if necessary. 
Importantly, as I say, there can be multiple barriers within that umbrella of treatment. Uh, the second argument he presented was an economic one. So we know that treatment can be expensive, but at least we know what we're getting. And we can rely on that when making difficult decisions. When the government is forced to make decisions, and this is relevant to my job, when I put up a business case, I'm constantly asked by decision makers about cash flow protection, where is the evidence? And it can be really difficult to provide, whereas at least with treatment, we know what we're getting when we pay for it. Now, Jason, the second speaker, um, talked about risks and customers. So in terms of risks, the overarching approach in the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines is the application of a considered risk management approach. If you look at any risk management framework, um, any matrix, you'll, it's always determined based on likelihood and consequence. And as, as Jason sort of stepped us through, both the likelihood and consequence of contamination generally increases the further downstream in the catchment you go. So at the end, where the treatment occurs, that's where you need to place the greatest focus. That's just a basic risk management approach. And in terms of customers, Jason made the point that, you know, gen in a lot of these catchments, we've actually seen customers asking for increased access. So the more you extend source water protection, the more the social impacts start to come in and the, the impacts on the community start to come in. So look, in summary, I think both Aaron and Jason presented a range of very compelling reasons why treatment provides greater surety than source water protection. Uh, Aaron presented, as I say, technical, scientific and economic reasons. Jason presented the risk-based and customer-based reasons. And I guess in conclusion, the most effective system is a multi-barrier approach that is focused primarily on treatment because at the end of the day, there is a simply a lack of evidence for source water protection in a validation world. Thank you. Great, thanks Clay. Um, again, a, a great summary of your case. And uh, I think there's nothing more to do apart from to hand over to Fiona to um, give a wrap up of the, um, of the debate. Thanks, Greg. Well, I think there were certainly some very challenging um, arguments in there challenging in terms of challenging our thinking and making us think about things in a different way. Um, I'll be talking with Clay later about his arguments and uh, we'll dig into those a little bit further. But look, um, you know, I think that was a good debate in that even from me, my point of view, sitting here, I could feel myself reacting to those arguments. So clearly people were saying things that were challenging our thinking. So from that point of view, a very good debate. Um, I think we've got one final poll left, or another poll, sorry, at, to, ready to issue for participants. No, I think this poll four is what we're up to. Oh, okay, we're doing both. Okay, thanks, Tomo. So give people a moment to answer and then, um, and then we've got the other questions. So poll, poll four has just come up on your screen. So this is really about the debate outcome. Are we doing enough to support the principle, the, the, the protection of source waters to the maximum degree practicable? So if you think we're doing enough, could we do more? Okay. So the next step that we have is for people to go off into workshops and um, have a look at the principles that were outlined earlier by Greg in a little bit more detail. I think Greg, you're gonna just run us through um, a few pointers for the workshops before people uh, head off. That's right, Fiona, yeah, just uh, a couple of um, housekeeping matters. So if, um, if we can get all attendees to turn on their videos um, so that we can, um, can be um, seen, but please stay muted until you're in your breakout rooms. Um, we've all, um, we've pre-assigned everybody into a specific breakout group. 
Um, and a member of the committee will be uh, your facilitator and will take you through, um, I guess, a more structured discussion around delving into the um, outcomes of the debate and also the principles um, that I presented earlier. I'd like to introduce you to um, our facilitators. We have Danielle Baker, Malcolm Hughes, Shane Papworth and Kelly Hill, along with um, myself, Carla and Andrew Bath will be, um, will be facilitating those smaller groups. Um, we'll have about 20 minutes or so, um, after which we'll get back together and then Fiona will give a final uh, summary and wrap up of some of the outcomes that we've been discussing. So, um, just to let you know that the breakout rooms will be also be recorded. Um, so if there's a, a problem with that, please tell us before we um, hit the record button. Um, so apart from that, I think that's covered up pretty much everything we need to know about the breakup rooms. So I think we're good to go, Tomo. Okay, well, I think that brings us to the final stage of our workshop. We've got about six minutes left to go. Uh, so some of these, I've got some comments still coming through from people in terms of what was discussed in the workshop. What I wanted to do is just sort of maybe touch on some of the points that came through from earlier on in the sessions and some of the other speakers. And I think, you know, if we just reflect back to the beginning when we heard from Phil Duncan, we learned about the values that are important to his people, the rivers, the fish, the elements of the landscape, the role of seasonal indicators, um, and you know, how they use those to indicate the health and the country of the water. And he spoke about the symbiotic relationship his people have with the water. Uh, you know, you, and I guess really what that says to us is when we manage our catchments well, then there's a nexus with what Aboriginal people seek from their waterways. So it's not only high quality water, which is easy to treat for drinking, but that also is better for, our, for the values that Aboriginal people seek, such as healthy and uh, aquatic ecosystems that provide the food that they're after, such as the, the fish and the plants and, you know, things that they're looking for. I think, you know, he made some really interesting points around um, the fact that the past is relevant today. And if you recall, he talked about, we need to walk into our future backwards. He, you know, he sees what we leave our next generation as being very important. And he spoke about the strong linkages with catchment management. And I think as water supply operators and managers, we often commend the foresight of the generations that went before us and the actions they took to protect water supplies protections that are still paying dividends today. So our, and our role really is to take the same bold steps to protect source water protection, source water for future generations. And I think Susie also touched on this when she was doing her debate talk. Um, Carla and Greg gave us an overview of the increasing pressures. They raised that question about when is the right time to reduce the risk to source water? Is really just relying on UV considered an acceptable management response to increased levels of risks in the catchment. They took us through the 10 principles, um, the need to drive for complementary outcomes. Um, I think as we talked about in the workshop I was just in, principle four really resonated quite strongly with me, um, the need to avoid complacency. And I think that can be one of the risks that we have in our industry. We are all so good at doing our jobs that people think it's always easy and we can just always make the outcomes um, safe for people. So I do think we need to be aware of that. Um, I think that you know the debaters did um, a fantastic job, certainly challenged our thinking and um, you know really got us examining why we undertake um, actions the way we do. Are we having the right discussions? Are we thinking about the right aspects um, with these things? I think the um, poll results, uh, we didn't really get to go through them in our workshop, but um, they'll be interesting. Um, I'm sure each of the workshops would have had a discussion around those, but they'll be interesting um, for people to get a, just get a feel for what the rest of the group was thinking when they were listening to these presenters and um, thinking about those questions. So some of the other outcomes from the workshops, I think um, in the workshop that Greg was facilitating, um, some of the comments that they had around the principles was not just about protection, but also land management. So we need to address degraded lands. We need something to protect. Um, they would like to see more positive language about enhancing land management. So that could help justify investment in this area. Um, the water literacy needs to be included and made, and made a greater emphasis, extend through protection um, through partnerships. And can we split utility land management and partnerships as two principles? So something for us to, something for the group to consider, something for the committee to consider. 
um, and need a balance, but public health cannot be compromised. And I think um, even, you know, during the debate, there were some interesting parallels that were drawn with the current COVID-19 crisis and, you know, how important it is to protect public health in the community. Uh, and principle nine, people felt that was quite, uh, was worth emphasising. Uh, some of the other points, we've got some from Andrew Barth. Um, so the session, the room that he was looking after. Um, question one, a water utility is more likely to implement source water protection. I think the consensus in that room was no, budget goes to water treatment plants. Uh, so are we protecting um, sources to the maximum degree possible? And uh, the, the response there was no, must, there must be a balance between the water treatment plant and um, source water protection. Um, any disagreement with the principles? Well, I think um, the, the feeling in that room was it was really more about the, the context of it. From Malcolm's um, workshops and Malcolm Hughes, uh, some of the points from his discussion that we aren't doing enough to protect the catchments. We need to involve the Aboriginal people in finalising the statement. That's probably a very good suggestion. Um, the committee needs to investigate the options to implement the statements and the principles. Um, the statement could focus more on enhancement of catchments, not just protection. And the committee could investigate the benefits and evidence of catchment protection, perhaps develop a standard around this. One of the challenges that we have. In the room that Kelly uh, was looking after, they had some, you know, some suggestions about how we could better express some of these principles, especially um, principle one, so around the social benefit. Um, they had, you know, principle two, they talked about some of the challenges in validating these, um, in validating some of those aspects of it. Um, also principle three, the way it's expressed, maybe we could do, we could work on that. Um, and then they looked, they had a, a longer discussion, or a bit of a discussion around principle seven, so uncontrollable, they thought from a source water protection point of view, um, water quality at the treatment plant, treatment end, continuous supply versus potable water quality. Um, Danielle's workout room, um, breakout room, sorry, values should be equally important. Um, community conversations and community ideals. Um, drinking water on health takes primacy. Recreation, mining in the catchment, social and economic has to be balanced. So look, I think I haven't even probably made it through all of the points. I've got Carla's here as well. Cumulative impacts is a big issue, you know, that, that, that is a very good point and should be highlighted. New and emerging water quality issues, protection helps reduce those. And um, there are some, you know, some parts, some water supplies in the country that are benefiting from being protected for so long, not having to ma manage some of the risks that some of the other supplies, that some of the other supplies are um, having to manage. So, you know, the ongoing challenges we have in industry to measure outcomes from our catchment interventions, um, that's something that's come up a lot. It's not an exact science. Doesn't mean we should be, but we shouldn't be doing it. Um, you know, there's certainly a strong desire for an evidence-based approach. So I think um, there was also some, you know, a lot of people spoke about um, the value in integrating the natural and social sciences for good outcomes here. So not just focusing on one part of it, but looking for that balance and those mutually um, beneficial outcomes. And also in the workshop that I was in, there was that, uh, you know, quite a bit of a focus on where's the discussion at in the industry? Are we talking about source water protection? Or are we talking more about water treatment? And there was a general consensus that probably we are talking more about water treatment and maybe, you know, the onus on us is to try and bring that conversation back more to a more holistic solution and look at catchment interventions as part of that. So look, I think really that brings us to the end of our session today. Um, it has been, you know, thought provoking. It has been challenging. Um, it has been really good. I've found, I've really enjoyed it. Found it has extended my knowledge in a number of different areas. Um, got me thinking about things. It's certainly given me some other things that I will go and look further into. I just really want to take uh, this time to firstly, thank the Catchment Management Specialist Network Committee for such an engaging event. Um, really did a great job pull, pulling this one together. A special thanks too to Tomo, who managed the large number of speakers that we had for this event. We were always confident that she was on top of this. I think she was probably a little bit worried at the beginning about how that was all going to work, but it did work um, really well. So well done to all of those people. And really thank you to our workshop participants for your input to the draft principles, 
We hope that you've found today, um, that today has extended your understanding of these issues, you, that you've found it an engaging session and uh, that you got a lot out of it in terms of how you're investing your time in setting the industry up for the future. Thank you.